the Triathlon Show 398. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Gareth Sanford. Gareth is a physiologist at the Canadian Sports Institute. He has worked across uh, a multitude of individual and team sports within uh, different Olympic systems and uh, within major sports leagues where he has supported over 400 athletes that have achieved 18 Olympic, Paralympic and World Championships medals and one world record. A lot of what we discuss in today's interview with Gareth is uh, related to athlete profiling and how to use that in your training process. And uh, Gareth did a fantastic job making sure the whole discussion was very relevant for this audience of triathletes, even though his main work is in the domain of sports of much shorter duration, so in that one to ten minute range. But uh, the point I'm getting to is that I want to give a heads up about some acronyms we're using that uh, you might not be familiar with, because Gareth's research has been related to the anaerobic speed and anaerobic, anaerobic power reserve so those are the first two acronyms that you will hear a lot the asr and apr anaerobic speed reserve anaerobic power reserve then you will hear mss which is the maximum sprinting speed or corresponding to that the maximum peak power and then finally we have the mas and the map and they are the maximum aerobic speed and maximum aerobic power you have probably or maybe at least heard of them before because these are terms that we have used on this show uh, but yeah we'll leave the definition definitions we discussed that later in the episode but just so you know the acronyms asr anaerobic speed reserve mss maximum sprinting speed mas maximum aerobic speed so you can keep track of them before we get into the interview big thanks to our sponsors precision fuel and hydration they help athletes perform at their best with electrolyte and fueling products and with free online tools education and a patented sweat test you can use the free fuel and hydration planner on their website to get a personalized plan for your carbohydrate sodium and fluid intake and you can book a free 20 minute video consultation to chat through your plan with the athlete support team. i have used their entire range of products for a long time and i think they're absolutely brilliant and you can get 15 percent off your first order by using the code tts23 on precision fuelandration.com and thank you to form the form smart swim goggles give you real-time feedback in your swim training right on the goggle lens including your splits pace stroke rate and heart rate this means that you can execute your swim workouts better whether it's pushing harder when you're starting to fall off the pace or holding back when you're accidentally going faster than you should it also means that you can get rid of using your gps watch in the pool uh, because the goggles will automatically take note of the start and stop of each interval and give you accurate split i also think it adds more fun and motivation to the swimming when you have the engagement of feedback after every length of the pool you can get 15 percent off the goggles with the code tts15 on formswim.com forward slash tts now without any further ado here's the interview with gareth sanford Welcome to the Triathlon Show, Gareth. How are you doing? Hey, Michael. Good, good to be here. It's uh, nice to have you. We've been trying to schedule this for quite a long while, and uh, it's really nice to, to finally have managed. Uh, can you take a moment to just uh, start by introducing yourself uh, to the audience? Yeah, sure thing. And thanks for your patience. It's definitely uh, one of the challenges of traveling on the road with, uh, with sports. Yeah, so my name is Gareth. I'm a uh, kind of sports science consultant and I specialize in sports that really need both high levels of high levels of speed and high levels of endurance together um, whereas often uh, we have sports that may be a bias in just one or the other but the middle ground of team sports of middle distance sports and of sports where there's large elements of surging, and things like a finishing sprint. So that's kind of the intersection of where where I specialize. I'm originally from the UK, but I haven't lived there for a little while. Um, that involved uh, studying at Loughborough University, um, did a placement with Chelsea Football Club, and went back to Loughborough, did some sprints coaching, worked with the triathlon set up there, so GB development squads and the Loughborough Sport set up. Then did some more sprints coaching in India and the US with with Altis, learning from Coach Dan Paff and Stu McMillan and that and that crew. 2015, I moved out to New Zealand to work with their Athletics Federation, and that's where I started really diving into this area of speed and endurance together. 
How do we program it? How do we unlock the puzzle of different types of people trying to do the same event? Um, that led to a six and a half month journey around the world, working with over 80 coaches, 200 athletes, both collecting PhD data, which we can get into, but also sitting down with coaches and saying, hey, you have challenges at this side of the table on the speed end and this on the endurance side. How are you navigating that? And then how are you navigating that with athletes everywhere in between those two ends? As part of that, I spent a bit of time in Canada and at the end of my PhD in time in New Zealand, I got hired out to Canada as uh, so where I'm now based in Victoria, British Columbia. And that was to do a postdoc with uh, Trent Stellingworth. And that was primarily around wider aspects of running. So a combination of um, pacing, biomechanics, some technology bits as well. And um, yeah, alongside that, Day to day now, I work with a bunch of team sports, coaches, practitioners, return to play scenarios where people are trying to get a handle of how do we program speed and endurance together and how do we individualize that. So, yeah, that's me. That's a that's a good summary. Uh, a couple of follow-ups on that. What is yeah. your own sporting background? Uh, do, do you come to this with, uh, yeah, some any kind of background uh, yourself as an athlete? Certainly not as an elite athlete, but uh, recreationally as a, a very keen football player. So a lot of uh, five aside. And then like in the summer, I would do track and field and cricket. Yeah. Right. And uh, and secondly, um, what is your favorite sport now to work with or the most interesting one of since you are involved in, in a few different sports? Yeah, I would say every sport presents a different a different challenge. I mean, the 800 meters in running is what I specialized in for PhD. So I've probably been deepest on that one. But like yesterday, I was with rowing and swimming. Uh, you know, this afternoon, I'm going to be with athletics, uh, boxing tomorrow, you know, so it's a real blend. Yeah. So you're sitting on the fence. <laughs> okay, can I can I tempt you to to say a favorite or or is it uh Well, I think um, I think the umbrella would be the sports that have those speed and endurance pieces together. Because yeah. actually, whilst the technical tactical demands might be different, the challenge is actually very similar and maybe more similar sometimes than people appreciate. Okay, yeah. yeah. So so when we're talking about these uh, sports with speed and endurance, if we obviously one example that you mentioned would be football, uh, t- different team sports, but in sports that are fall under the uh, kind of endurance sports category, like the or 800 mid distance uh, events at a mile on the track and uh, then we have yeah the various swimming events in the same time duration scope mm-hmm. track cycling and uh, rowing as you mentioned uh different yeah kayaking i think has, has some sports yep. in that duration what is what would you say how would you define the duration in these kinds of events uh as yeah where is that sweet spot where speed and endurance are both really important yeah, I think um, there's a sliding scale of the relative uh, balance of speed and endurance. So the area with the most variability in the types of athlete that can be successful in the sport tend to be in that one to 10 minute duration. And that's because you can very much approach it from the speed end or the endurance end and still be able to um compete in that time duration but if you think of like even a a sprint triathlon or an olympic distance triathlon there are elements there where there are big surges in races or you think of like a bike leg of the yokohama triathlon right there's a lot of repeated sprint like sometimes surprisingly on a power profile and so every time someone is having to surge i think we have to ask the question of what are the things that underpin that so there's a increase in the amount of power they have to transmit. So there's a, a force component to that. There's a technical component to that. There's a coordination component to that. And the limitation to those moments is not energy supply. It's how quickly can you put force down, right? And how can you change the force expression you're applying to the pedal or in running that you're applying to the ground to speed up? And can you do that efficiently? Now, if you have to do that a number of times, of course, there's then an energy system component that 
comes underneath and supports the repeated ability to do that. But what I often find one of the big challenges in this space, and this spans Olympic distance, triathlon, 10K running, all the way down to the middle distance, is if we as coaches or support staff only have eyes on one part of that puzzle, whether that be endurance or speed, then in those moments that define race outcomes, so the sprint finishes, the surges, we are for sure leaving something on the table in our ability to be extremely competitive at that end. That is not saying, hey, if you have a large maximal peak power, you're going to be the one there at the end of the Tour de France, right? But this is where it's not an either or, it's a both and. And when you look at your squad, you're going to have people who have different balances and those qualities. And so being successful in my mind at the highest level is having an understanding of A, what your athletes balance are in those two qualities, and then being able to really maximize that so they can leverage that in the moments that matter. Because ultimately, that's what's going to differentiate them in those key defining race moments. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I definitely don't mean to make this all about triathlon because I think there are a lot of sports where it makes a lot more sense to talk about the yeah, the speed sure. and endurance. But but one area within triathlon where I've been thinking that this makes maybe where it is the most relevant is within the swim training because that's where you usually have a squad of athletes training together, and the swim training is set up more or less quite similarly to how pool swimmers training for short events are training because we still break it up into relatively short intervals do quite a bit of speed work some longer intervals but the longer intervals are still kind of close to threshold or critical speed if you will very often uh yeah. so so it's and and this is where you have, uh, you see some athletes thriving and some barely surviving <laughs> quite yeah. often and, and 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 this is what i've been kind of pondering since reading some of your work at least that yeah maybe in in swim training for triathletes is that's where like yeah really taking into consideration the the different profiles and 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 being more cognizant of that would would be really relevant even in a triathlon setting yeah maybe it's worth us before we dive too far into the sports side is to kind of back up and maybe just run through what we mean by profiles and what what we're actually sure. kind of look, looking at there so maybe if we we start there so as a first layer um, of understanding that speed and endurance or power and endurance balance in your training group i think about collecting two key measures the first one is the maximal sprinting speed or maximal peak power that the athlete has so in the running sense, that would be measured over a 50-meter sprint. On the bike, that would be measured in a 10-second all-out sprint, and you would take the highest three-second average as your maximal peak power. Why is that important? Because this measure is primarily limited by force and technique. These are, this is a piece of you being able to surge successfully. Okay. Then I look at the maximal aerobic speed or maximal uh, aerobic power. And if you look at uh, Dejo Sanders' work in professional cycling, you know, he would use a six-minute effort to estimate MAP on the bike. I would use a six-minute effort uh, as a run, which usually works out around a 2K time trial. We've used that very successfully with our runners, and it correlates extremely closely to velocity at VO2 max in the lab like a 0.96 or 0.97, very, very close as a correlation. Why do I use a six-minute duration? Well, if we try to run a VO2 max intensity for as long as we can, it would primarily land in that six-ish plus or minus minutes duration. Anything that's a lot longer, that, longer than that, the intensity drops so much that actually you're not right at it. And if you are, say, do a three-minute effort or a four-minute effort, you underestimate that value. Divine, defining um, the velocity of VO2 max as the first speed or power at which you hit VO2 max intensity. Now, there is a lot of debate about, hey, if you work slightly above critical power and you do that for 20, 30, 40 minutes, you will eventually reach VO2 max. And I agree 
with that. That's absolutely the case. But my point here with using MAP or MAS is that when we think about how we're going to train that VO2 max stimulus, I haven't seen anybody anywhere with the aim of training VO2 max doing so by trying to ride just above critical power for 20, 30 minutes, with that being the primary aim. And so when we come to the training application of these physiological landmarks to create an adaptation on an ongoing basis, we want light and shade between VO2 max intensity and that moderate critical speed, critical power intensity. So that's how I differentiate those two. So given those two landmarks, we then have a rough idea of what is the general energy system competency of this individual and what is the technique and force capability of this individual. And then when you line those items up across your squad, you can see, oh, we've now got a real spread of people who are bringing different qualities to the table. And some of Dejo Sanders' work in professional cycling is very interesting because we talked about the 800 meters to start with, right, which is one, one minute, 40, two minutes event duration. But even in sports where it lasts days and weeks, we still see this variability. We still this, see this variability. And so it poses the question in our training and how we treat these individuals, should we be giving them the same thing? And how should that look different across different intensities? Because even in these endurance dominant sports, people present differently. But if we only have eyes on one part of the equation, whether it's the endurance side or the speed side, we're not necessarily fully meeting that person where they are in in the things they bring to the table. A lot of people listening here will be more familiar with the classic kind of endurance tests. So yeah. not so familiar with what is done in the track and field world or or so on. So can you can you give some one or two examples of uh, because I assume that not every coach that you met and talked with, for example, when you were traveling around the world, yeah. did these particular tests. How did they profile or test their athletes if they did at all? Uh, when yeah, what is what what is what is common practice around the world? Yeah, that's a great question. I think people have very different starting points. And again, that's um, based on who they were coached by or what their experience was as an athlete or so on. Um, So people who were already doing the testing would use timing gates or radar gun or this kind of thing or, you know, at the most basic level, a stopwatch. Those who maybe weren't already doing the testing or weren't consistently training it, even if that was the case, they still had the appreciation of, hey, this is a piece of the performance that is happening, right? In the men's 10,000 meters, for example, to be on the podium, you probably need to be able to close the the last kilometer in about 225, okay, at the Olympic level and to, and to run the last 452 seconds. Now, there are many, many endurance athletes who, even if they started that 10K on the last lap, would not be able to run 52 seconds. And so we have to be able to talk about that as a community. And we have to be able to go, okay, at the lower levels, yes, just being aerobically strong might be enough to be successful. But if you have aspirations to reach podiums and to be a factor higher and higher up the pyramid of your sport, then this piece of also maximizing the sprinting speed and power alongside the endurance is the thing that once you get into those higher levels differentiates those medal outcomes. And so that's where in endurance athletes, because of the volume component of training, the question for coaches really is how do we develop that quality alongside the volume? It's not impossible to do later on, but it does become harder when you're under a a high training volume and you think about sprinting and technique is a coordination motor pattern. So ideally you want to be more fresh when you're learning that. So the big advantage for all of us, and we, we started rolling this out in New Zealand where primarily we had age 16 to 18 development athletes was we would teach all of them to sprint. And that might be a, a six to 18 month journey from going, hey, on the technical side, are you balanced? Do you have range of motion? 
do you know how to coordinate your arms and legs and how that should feel you know what's your stride length and stride frequency and are you limited or overusing one of those stride frequency if you overuse there's a huge energy cost to that so that's not good for endurance sport if you over index on frequency and stride length if you over index on extending your stride length there's a point where you start breaking and so that's the technical side that we really focus on with people and then on the on the strength based side it's okay well what's your maximal force do you actually know how to apply force and often as endurance athletes why do we end up in endurance often it's because hey we weren't that fast right and so at that at that kind of journey point of going hey do i do a speed based event or an endurance based event if i took the endurance path did i ever fully learn how to maximize those force qualities and what it means to put force down and so there's a there's a piece there of the maximal force the rate of force development so can you produce it quickly and then stiffness so that when we're putting force in the ground we're not just kind of flopping on the floor we're able to actually re- react and bounce back and so those qualities as you can probably hear if you're listening don't have to be developed just from sprinting they can be developed in the weight room they can be developed with kind of physio and treatment practice and there's laying a foundation of that stuff to get you to the point where actually yeah doing a couple of all out sprints a few times a week is a normal thing because you've built a foundation of being able to do that um so that's that's kind of the the process i would take someone on in thinking about hey if i've never done sprinting before you know some examples would be like we would use jump rope you know and what's that that's low level plyometrics right and learning to apply force in a very safe manner we would use hills a lot and what does the hill do it acts as a forcing function for you to get into better technical positions to learn to push into the floor and if you don't push enough then if you don't get in the right position you fall flat on your face so you learn very quickly so there's all these things that actually might not feel like you're training speed but actually you are you're improving your capabilities to express force and that not only has benefits at the sprinting speed end but when we think about things like running economy because running economy is a is an oxygen exchange but there's also a muscle tendon unit part to that and so some of these things that are improving the sprinting speed end also can help out lower down the intensity spectrum too yeah no that's a that's a really good uh good overview uh do you think that the that sprinting is how trainable is it uh compared to endurance i mean i think that most people would agree that endurance is very very trainable and i think that's why a lot of people uh at recreational athletes enjoy it because you can get better at it um but do you think sprinting is equally trainable or is it a bit more tricky similar to let's say like swim technique is something that a lot of people would say that yeah you can get better at it but if you didn't swim when you were young it's it's really hard to get super proficient at it yeah the the answer to that question really can only truly be uh satisfied if you've checked off the box of maximizing all those elements that underpin sprinting speed right you can only say yeah this we've moved this as far as we can if we've checked off all those technical and strength-based items we just talked through yesterday i was talking with one of my good friends jason hetler at img academy and in a 12-week block with some junior tennis players so if we think about tennis matches go on for how long right hours Mm -hmm. in a 12-week block of focusing on sprinting speed they moved on average the group 14 percent improvement in their sprinting speed in juniors that's a massive amount you know and so we can sit here and go well it doesn't move right but my question would always be well to what degree have we checked the boxes of moving all those determinants and and maybe an important point to address is why does this matter so much because ultimately it is an endurance event right ultimately it is an endurance event that we're thinking about or it is a middle distance event that we're thinking about and the reason why this matters is where the sprint ceiling sits and where the maximal aerobic speed or power sits 
affects the relative percentage that an effort above VO2 max sits as a percentage of that anaerobic speed reserve or power reserve, that sprint range. And so if you imagine two athletes who have the same speed or power at VO2 max, but one has, let's say, a maximal peak power of 1600 watts and one has a maximal peak power of 1200 watts, let's say they both have to do an effort that's at 1000 watts as part of a sprint or a surge. If I'm the athlete who's got a speed reserve, a power reserve of 1600 watts, that's a much, much lower percentage of the reserve that I have than if I'm the guy with 1200 watts. So when we think about, okay, well, what, what does that mean? What's the relative cost of that? Well, the percentage of the anaerobic power reserve or the percentage of the anaerobic speed reserve that we're, we're operating at gives us an idea of a blend of qualities, right? It tells us the blend of what is the energy system cost, both aerobic and anaerobic, because we're operating above VO2 max. It tells us the buffering cost. It tells us the neuromuscular and mechanical contributions. There's a blend of all those things. And so what's the recovery out of that for those two individuals? The one who's a, got a 1600 watt maximal peak power was working at such a low percentage of his anaerobic power reserve that actually his ability to go in and repeat and recover from that effort is very, very different to the person who's operating at such a high percentage of what they have at 1200 watts to do that. And so ultimately, the reason the maximal peak power or maximal sprint speed become important is because as you move up the performance uh, ladder, once you get to the world class level, you're getting into a, a field where everyone has a minimum of that maximal peak power that's required to be in that arena. And then those that can operate at a lower percentage of what they have for as long as they can combined with the durability piece that I know you've talked about with one of my good friends, Ed Maunder, right? You blend those two things together and those are the people that can repeat and recover those power profiles at the back end of a race because they built the durability aerobically and from a nutrition fueling point of view and they've got the neuromuscular mechanical qualities to also tolerate those repeated surges. And so... That's the key piece in application eventually. But often what I'm finding and what I found on my world collection is in a lot of middle uh, and long distance runners, we're not even getting to the stage where we're maximizing that sprinting speed. So we can't really even have a good conversation about, okay, now we want to start lowering the percentage of anaerobic speed or power reserve that you're working at because we haven't set the scaffolding. So at the moment, for example, I, I've been working with short track speed skating for the last year. Wonderful sport. And one of the things we've been looking at is, number one, do you get the same variability of profiles in short track speed skating as you do in, in running and rowing and cycling and swimming and team sports? And the answer to that question is absolutely you do. This is everywhere, right? And then number two, if you are a, a speed-based profile, so someone with a larger anaerobic speed or power reserve, or your more endurance type where you have a lower anaerobic speed power reserve but a higher max aerobic power, max aerobic speed, um, does that make a difference on whether you can actually be competitive at international versus world-class level? So international level would be somebody who's making a, a team. World-class level would be somebody who's in the top eight and getting podiums. And what we found is you can make the podium in the 1,000, the 1,500, and the 500. Those are the three key short track speed skating events, whichever profile you are. But the key item, the key item that we found was how those individuals, whether they're an endurance or a speed-based profile, how they're getting to that best performance is leveraging their own profile. So what do we see with the speed people? They have such a big speed reserve that actually one of the things they do is they can work at a much higher percentage of that higher reserve. That's what they're leveraging to maximize their own performance. Whereas the more endurance dominant profile, because their preferences go out at a high percentage of their aerobic system and hold on to it, what, how they're getting to their best performance is working at 
a lower percentage of their anaerobic speed power reserve because they've got such a high max aerobic speed or max aerobic power. And so this totally blows open the narrative of there's one way to get there. There's one training model to make this happen. You know, only certain molds of athletes can be successful in a type of event. And I even see that in triathlon. Like you you think, hey, triathlon, um, you know, these are all going to be endurance profiles. That would be one one thought process. Would would you agree? Yeah, I think I think we all we have talked about it enough on this podcast yeah. that everybody knows that that's not the case. There are very different profiles. Yeah. But I think yeah. what we as triathletes, what we would call a speed profile, has very little speed compared to the athletes that we're talking about now in the eight hundred meter or the short track speed skating. But still, yeah. relative to the competition, there would be endurance and speed profiles within triathlon. That, that would be my take on it. Yeah, it's a good point. And maybe let's come back to my process for classifying athletes in just a second. But I want to give this example. So there was a triathlon session I was at about a year ago. Uh, We were doing a threshold session. So second inflection on a lactate curve, aiming to be in that three and a half millimole range for the session. Coach wanted to do six by 1200 meters. Okay. And we started the first, first two. And we were having the following conversation trackside. It looked like for one of the athletes, 1,200 was too much. For one of them, it looked about right. And for one of them, it looked like it was too easy. And actually, we needed to push that out to 2K. And how I would describe those athletes' profiles, one was definitely more of a hybrid profile. So maybe on a balance of a triathlon continuum, probably more the super league slash Olympic distance type person, someone who was a pure like Olympic distance type athlete, and then someone who probably in the future, in the longer term, might become an ultra somebody. So there we've almost got like a hybrid and endurance and then like an endurance plus type individual. And so that's where it really starts to come out in the day to day, because how easy would it have been for them all to just do six by 1200 one of them feeling like, hey, that was harder than I thought it should be. One going, yeah, that was pretty good. And then another one going, hey, I could do more of these. And when you think about the impact of that every day, that compounds and adds up into, hey, are we actually maximizing the individuals that we have based on what they're presenting with and what they're bringing to the table? Yeah, no, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we here we're talking about threshold training and yeah. i know when we talked about profiling you didn't really talk about critical speed critical power yeah but i know from some of your um tweets and stuff that it is something that you look at so can you can you discuss oh, how, that, how that fits into the the profiling yeah for sure so when i was in new zealand and i started looking at this topic a lot of people are fairly isolated in their training situations they don't have a lot of facilities right and so my question was how do you have a test like a six minute time trial and a sprint that can give someone who's in the middle of nowhere a way of going what type of person do i have okay so that's the that's the reason for keeping the testing very simple but based on you know a scientific rationale from the max aerobic speed or the six minute test I then, if it's a team sport and I don't have the luxury of the lab, for example, um, I will estimate the critical speed. Um, at in t- so in, in a highly trained endurance athletes, it can be, as you know, somewhere between 85, 95% of that VO2 max pace, generally speaking. Typically, because team sports often don't spend time at this stimulus, their threshold starts below that right? Somewhere in the 75 to 80% type range. But a general comment about testing and profiling is I find often a lot of people get caught up in, am I doing the right test, right? Am I doing the right protocol? Is this the right thing I'm looking at? And I would say like, you need to very quickly get past the testing and get into training. Testing is a two-part process. If we have a new athlete come in and we don't know anything about them, we're going from, hey, we want to do something to bring our understanding of where these thresholds are physiologically from 
a lot of variability to, okay, we think it's here, right? That's the idea of the test. The second part of our test is, okay, given those numbers, what training session are we now going to try and execute to target that quality? And this is the key piece. You need to get in and monitor that session to further turn the dial in the execution of that stimulus. And that's where I'd encourage most people to spend a lot of their time. Yes, do the test, but quickly get into when we decide to do a threshold session or a critical speed session, um, are people executing it right? And what would executing it right look like? It would mean we're in steady state physiology. Our breathing is not climbing. We might have a perceived effort that we anchor the session in, starting around a five, maybe climbing to a six. But if it starts to become a seven and an eight, then now it's starting to become something harder than what we intended. We might also collect heart rate and we might also collect lactate. The issue with relying on one of those would be that the adaptation timeframes are different. And so, for example, heart rate and the breathing are much more central adaptations. And so um, they tend to develop a lot more with high intensity because you're putting a, a large cardiac output through the heart, right? Whereas low and moderate intensity is what develops the peripheral adaptation in the blood. And so you could do, and I, I've done threshold sessions with, you know, steeplechasers, 5K athletes, and then let's say they do 10 by a kilometer on the treadmill. And I'm doing that as a monitored training session. You might get to rep three, four, five and go, hey, this is pretty good. You do all 10 heart rates within five beats for the whole session. But after five or six reps, the blood lactate starts climbing. And so what you find is, hey, even though cardiovascularly, centrally, our heart and lungs have adapted, we've not yet built the endurance and trained the blood to be able to buffer, right, and clear at that intensity. And so just having one of those markers only tells you one part of the puzzle, right? So I'm using the intersection of the breathing, the perceptual response, the heart rate, the lactate to make that judgment of, hey, is their threshold where the test said it is? And then not just that, but as we go week by week with training, are we moving that on? Are we adapting? Because I want you as an athlete to progress as quickly as, as you're adapting. I don't want to stand still just because the test said, hey, your power is here. It's like, well, maybe, but certainly if, you know, you go into things like uh, double threshold type training models popularized by the Norwegians, right, then you can move things on very, very quickly and be in a very different place in four to six weeks. And so we have to quickly, in my opinion, move from doing the test to doing the training and monitoring the training, that's where we need to spend the majority of our time because this is where a lot of people get it wrong. They think their power is this, they're overdoing it, and then you get to the key training blocks of the season and you go, so and so is not performing. We thought we'd done the work, but if they were overdoing it every session, then they didn't build the bank account in the way you thought they did. And so we really have to close that gap between intention and execution. And that, to me, is the two-part piece of testing. Yeah, no, absolutely. That makes makes sense. Yeah. Um, I want to come back to a bit about the training, but tra training using the anaerobic speed reserve or anaerobic yeah. power reserve. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. maybe first, just to make sure everybody understood it, because I'm not sure yeah. we said it very clearly, but the anaerobic speed reserve would be the difference between the maximum sprinting speed and uh, and um, uh, MAS. So, exactly. so it would be a range, yeah. right? And then and then you would work at a percentage. So it would be 0% when you're right at MAS, and it would be 100% when you're right at maximum sprinting speed and somewhere in between when you're when you're above MAS, but not at maximum sprinting speed. So, And, exactly. and the, the, the premise is that in the past, in maybe not so much in training, but at least in the research world, we've had sessions prescribed as let's say 110% of MAS. But the premise is that for that would be a very different session for an endurance type versus speed type or hybrid type, and yeah. and and prescribing the session as based on the anaerobic speed reserve instead would allow us to equalize a bit more. Is is that a correct understanding? Yeah, that's a that's a good summary. Maybe just to strengthen the point, someone having a, 
a larger sprinting speed on maximal peak power means that they have different mechanical and neuromuscular qualities to the person next to them. So if we do not factor that in to our training prescription of these workloads above VO2 max, then that's where you run into a session where someone could be working at 20% of their anaerobic speed reserve versus 40% if you've prescribed at 110%, let's say, of MAS. Because the mechanical neuromuscular qualities they have are very different. And so by pres- prescribing it as a percentage of the athlete's own reserve, you are reducing the differences in the stimulus that is experienced by them. And so that's the important difference. Because again, that compounds over time. If it's too hard for someone or not hard enough for someone else, then you're over or underdoing the stimulus every day. And then you get to the end of a training block and you go, well, so-and-so didn't respond. And we go, okay, well, that didn't work. And it's like, well, did it? Is that like, is that the problem? Or did we apply a stimulus that actually was not quite right for that individual? Yeah. So maybe, and, maybe to go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just, just to come back to my point about swimming. This is why, mm-hmm. why I think that swimming is so relevant in, um, or to anaerobic speed reserve is so relevant to swimming in triathlon because, well, if we look at the elite triathletes that do uh, sprint and Olympic distance racing, yes, they do do some sprint workouts on the bike uh, to simulate courses like Yokohama or most other courses. To be honest, they do have a lot yeah. of turns and, and accelerations. But most, mo- let's say most recreational athletes, they don't do the type of training and they frankly don't need to do it. And they would rarely train above their MAS or MAP. And I also think that that makes sense. They don't really need to train above that intensity. But in swimming, it's different uh, because that's where we can have workouts where we do 50s or 25s or even 100s. And, and we just, we're in a squad. We try to go as fast as possible. And, and we're actually going significantly harder than our maximum aerobic speed for, for swimming. And, and this is where, again, a speed type would find that session more tolerable because they have a high, higher reserve than, than an endurance type and, and where knowing okay what is my profile and how should i adapt the session to fit my profile that that would be a useful uh, a useful use of of this concept yeah I'd, i'd maybe like to address a myth and then let's come into how how i actually profile so that's really clear for people mm-hmm. so a myth i want to address here is to be fast doesn't have to come from doing high intensity training because The thing we're talking about with maximal peak power, maximal sprinting speed is not limited by energy system. It's limited by technique and force. And so if you think of week one of a training season where you'd be, you know, you'd be building up your training volume in terms of mileage, often I feel people feel that they have to be doing, you know, hard speed endurance type intervals that spike lactate really high almost year round. And that's really, really not the case. It's really not the case. What you actually need to be doing is alongside developing your low and moderate intensity, your critical speed, your threshold, you want to be tapping into that three to six second all out power. So as we talked about, that could be, yes, actually sprinting and doing that, but it should also be the foundational things underpinning that. And you will see improvements alone from just improving that before you get to high intensity training and this is something that is overlooked left and right all the time um do i value high intensity training absolutely but do i do it every week with a like large physiological stress aim absolutely not because when we're building that i i think of analogy of a bank account and building a bank account low and moderate intensity work is like putting money in the bank Every time we do high intensity or we go and race or we go and travel, we're making withdrawals. And so we have to be really conscious about when we're making those withdrawals. So you can build and improve your speed at the top end without making withdrawals by focusing on the things that underpin the maximal three to six second power and speed. And that can start in the weight room and with physio and with treatment. And that can lead into hills and sprinting in time. And that is in the program year round. And there's a building phase to that. And then when we get more specific, 
okay, we've laid the scaffolding and now we're about trying to lower that percentage of ASR APR that we're working at. And that's when the more specific high intensity speed endurance type elements come into the training program. So maybe so, so how, does, in, how, does, how, how, how does that lower the percentage of ASR that you're working at uh, when you do when you add in the high intensity? Is it because it, raise, it raises the MAS or is there any other? Yeah, so with each of these things, there's a speed and intensity. And there's a, like, for example, let's say we did a, a step test. So some maximal testing and we do a three minute stage of, of effort. If you and I both did the test, Michael, and, you know, we both had our threshold test end up at the same speed or power. If we both then went and did a training session, you might be able to hold that threshold power for six, seven, eight minutes. I might only be able to hold it for three and a half. And so there's an element where, yes, you have the reserve that sets the table of what percentage it's at, but then there's also a training piece to build out the endurance Mm. at that percentage of ASR. So what we want to think about is are we building that scaffolding framework of the sprinting speed and the max aerobic speed and the critical speed underneath supporting it. And then there'll be specific periods of time where we go in and go, okay, now we're going to race soon. We're going to go in and we're going to build that specific endurance at race pace from a metabolic physiological chemistry specific aim. The rest of the year, we're spending time at that intensity, maybe mechanically and technically, but not with a physiological aim. So that means that you are never very far from being fit and ready to go because your sprinting speed is there. You're in touch with race pace technically. Your aerobic system and bank account is full because you've not been depleting it every week with lots of hard hammer, speed endurance, high intensity. Actually, when you do go there, because you built a bigger bank account and you have the scaffolding in place, you can now go and do larger volumes of intensity and get an even bigger stimulus. And that's the building over time that I think is really, really crucial. Mm. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, can we go into some, uh, maybe, maybe mid distance Should we do the profiling running? process? Profiling process, okay, let's do that yeah, first. Just yeah. to clarify, yeah. So step one, athlete comes in the door, 50 meter test to get the sprinting speed, six minute run to give you the max aerobic speed, that gives you the anaerobic speed reserve. That's the first thing I'm doing. Then something I will do as a screening process to understand that speed endurance balance in my squad is I will divide the sprinting speed by the max aerobic speed, which gives you a ratio and it gives you a nice spread of that balance. So what that visually can identify for you is anyone who's at the extremes. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you at the moment, an athlete top left or bottom right of your spread is very dominant in one area. So then we have to answer the question, well, why is that? Is that because of our training methods that they're very in one direction? Or is that because there are limiting factors we've addressed only in one area? And so the performance opportunity is actually imbalancing the other area. Okay, so that's a screening that I put the ASR data through. Then step three is going, okay, Given our profile, given the goals of the athlete, or let's say in a team sport setting, the role a coach is asking someone to play in a team, what are the benchmarks that we expect someone to be able to reach independently in max aerobic speed, maximal aerobic power, and maximal sprint speed, maximal peak power? So for example, I think there was a paper in Olympic triathlon showing, I think it was uh, top 10 uh, at the Olympics on the men's side on the bike, you need it like around a 490 MAP in wattage. And so if we're an athlete sat here going, hey, I'm somebody who eventually I want to be in the in the running in the Olympics, the ticket to the dance to be in that arena, to even be there, is to have an MAP in that kind of range. And so if we're not there, We have to do everything we can over the next few years to maximize capacities towards being able to do that. And it's not going to matter if we're batting at a 390 watts as an MAP. We have to be achieving those minimum benchmarks of the 
to the aspirations of our goals. And so that's step one. And you can achieve all of that on day one of profiling someone. Then it becomes about the day-to-day monitoring as I've talked to. Of like, okay, we think you're this type of profile based on where your absolute values sit and you can relativize them too, but the piece is still the same. The reality is still the same that, hey, there is a minimum ticket to the dance to the top event in the world. And if you want, that's where you want to play the game, you have to achieve those. That's an uncomfortable truth, but that's unfortunately the game. Um, then it becomes about, yeah, the daily training across every intensity. How is this person responding? We think they're this, but then what is the training showing? And use the training every day to deepen your understanding. Is someone more speed-based, someone more endurance-based? Huh, when we do a, a threshold session like the triathlon one I described, hey, this person seems to look comfortable after 1200s. Maybe we need to flood that more because they're really strong there. They're super, super endurance and they don't have a reserve because ultimately for people to maximize themselves, yes, they address their weaknesses, but when it comes to the championships, they're leveraging their own strengths to maximize their performance. So we need to steer the training to really maximize what, what they have. You know, I'm in a situation right now uh, with athletics where we have the Paralympic World Championships in three weeks, three, four weeks. And our athletes just came back from a racing block in in Europe. And the first thing the coach said to me when he came back, he said, in this last four weeks, we really want to steer more and more into the individuals that they are. So there's not a model. There's a who are we dealing with? We know the principles that are important. We're on a pursuit of understanding who they are, both physiologically and technically. And we're doing more and more to steer into who they are. But often we can run into scenarios where, you know, we have expectations of people need to be able to do this type of mileage per week or this kind of thing. And it's like, well, maybe which type of profile are we talking about? So we're we're trying to thread the needle of who we are, the athlete profile we have, the demands of the sport relative to the goals the athlete has. And then on the way, making sure that we're addressing the limiting factors, not just energetically, but also in the neuromuscular speed power. Because those are elements that are going to help you get to that 490 watts as an MAP. When, when we talk about on the way working on limitations that the athlete may have, is that something that you would uh, really just do consistently but not overdo at any point? Or would you have blocks where you would focus more on weaknesses versus blocks when you focus more on strengths? Yeah, it's a, it's a important area. I think the... There's two things like stages of development become important. So for example, if we're five, six, seven, eight years from potentially being an Olympic podium, the thing that's important in zero, three, four, five is not really racing in terms of performance outcome. It's actually building the blocks to be able to do the training that's required at a senior level to get towards the Olympic podium, make teams and get to the Olympic podium. And so if we're over-prioritizing performance and race results, we're not spending, what are we not doing? We're not spending time building the capacities and qualities that actually underpin super elite performance. We're actually, in many ways, taking away from our ability to do that in the long term because our focus is on results and performance. That's not saying racing isn't important. You know, we need the tactical exposure to that. We need the bike handling skills and all those things. And yeah, there is an element of racing, but we can be selective when we do that. But if we're in a, you know, uh, training to train and learning to train type period of time, we're in the business of building capacities. I mean, you've had the stuff on durability from Ed and Peter Leo and this, this kind of research in the endurance world. Yes, you need As table stakes, you need a power profile fresh that you can produce. But then you have to be able to do that after you've spent two and a half thousand kilocalories. And so how do we think we get there? We do this by building a huge bank account over time, building capacities. That doesn't happen in five minutes. That happens in years of compounding the aerobic system and not always making withdrawals because we're racing all the time. So it depends where we want to be. It's not an either or, but it's a selection of priorities. 
in building capacity versus racing for performance. Yeah. And uh, if we talk about that example with uh, the three different athlete types that you had in that threshold session, yeah. then are there any other things that in the in the day-to-day sessions with adjustments, like you mentioned, one athlete maybe doing a bit longer, one doing a bit shorter, are there other things in the bigger picture? You kind of mentioned mileage as well. Any other things to keep in mind that how considerations regarding the training structure for different profiles yes this applies at every training intensity how often are we stood in the middle of a track or a you know a a trail going hey okay we've we've done two or three of these we had five or six down but so and so is not looking very good what should we do the answer you come to could be 180 degrees different if we're talking about an endurance type athlete or a speed-based athlete. So if it is like a threshold type effort, that's really the bread and butter for the endurance and hybrid people. We want to be really careful with the speed people and how we deploy that. It's still an important stimulus. We're probably not going to go as long. We're going to have shorter intervals so we don't get too much of an anaerobic stimulus from what should be an aerobic, primarily aerobic stimulus. Um, So yes, at every intensity we're looking at those things so for example if we take a hard speed endurance session what do we know what do we know about endurance profiles what makes them who they are well we know that primarily they're more slow twitch in in muscle fiber and that those muscle fibers are built with a lot more aerobic enzymes and a larger amount of train lines connecting the oxygen delivery to the muscle in terms of capillaries and oxygen transport so their happy place for a training stimulus is flooding the aerobic system and staying in that steady state for long periods of time. When you do VO2 max intervals, these are the people that can handle once they've got a bank account of fitness, you know, two to three, four minute efforts at VO2 max in highly trained individuals. When you move beyond VO2 max with these type of individuals in a hard anaerobic session what are you forcing them to do you're forcing them to produce energy through the anaerobic glycolytic system which their muscle machinery is not preferentially built for and so large exposures to lots of heavy speed endurance work in athletes with a primarily aerobic endurance profile can really flatten those individuals whereas you take a speed type athlete particularly on the men's side where Speed type people tend to be much more anaerobic glycolytic. They've got fast twitch muscle. And as a result, they tend to have a higher baseline buffering. They can be much more tolerant to those harder anaerobic system because their muscle machinery, they've got more anaerobic enzymes. They have a preference to produce energy through that anaerobic glycolytic pathway. So the cost of that stimulus is very different. The flip side of that, when you go to very high intensity or sprinting speed, speed endurance type area, is that when speed people go fast, they're using high central nervous system demand. They're expressing large, large forces. So maybe what you have to be careful of there is actually how much and how often. So the density of prescription. So in the endurance world, we're very comfortable with volume as a prescription. More is better. As an endurance type person, something like 10 by 100 meters as a sprinting session might not feel like a lot. But I'm telling you right now, that is a massive, massive workload for sprinting. And so for most endurance and hybrid athletes, most of the time, two to three exposures a couple of times a week, so no more than five or six maximal efforts at that three to six second power is honestly enough because we're not trying to be sprinters. We're trying to maximize our reserve so we can lower the percentage of anaerobic speed or power reserve we're working at. And once we've maximized that, and we know that by we've checked all the determinants off, we now want to maintain and hold on to that as we move through the season so that when it comes to peak competition, our energy system is at its highest peak, our sprinting speed is there, and we're ready now to really tolerate a lot of race pace race pace work so that's how i think about that integration and the decision making so a lot of the conversations i'll be having with coaches track side is 
okay, do we want to do one or two more? What have we got tomorrow? Where does that intensity fit on the on the spectrum? What's the cost of that type of stimulus going to be for an endurance type versus a speed type? And then from there, together, we come to a, okay, well, let's go this way or this way. Yeah. What What do you think would happen or what, what would you do if you get a number of triathletes listening to this podcast through your door and they say, hey, I would like you to profile me? Would you use the exact same profiling with um, with the sprint test on the bike and run and uh, the M- uh, the MAS the six minute time trial? Would or would you? Let's rephrase the question. So a lot of athletes would do some sort of critical power test. So it might be yeah. a three minute test and a twelve minute test. Yeah. And and that critical power test also allows you to get a gauge of how you perform at shorter durations and longer durations. But of course, it's not a speed duration. You don't get that measure um so yeah how how would you square that is there is it something that athletes really should consider that hey you need to add that sprint test to really know your profile or yeah what's your take on that yeah that's a that's a good one when we look at the critical power testing and the outputs of that we have to ask the question of okay what elements of performance is that addressing right and the Assumptions and outputs of the critical power model are energetically driven. And so in cycling, let's say, where it's a more close skill, perhaps the applications of that model are the strongest, okay, because you have probably less variability on the bike than you would do if you took people running. But if we took your critical power test, Michael, and we took mine, and then we tried doing workloads above critical power and particularly beyond VO2 max, our biomechanics are so different that the estimates from this model do not really take into account those differences in mechanical efficiency. That would be one piece. Another piece is if we're so focused on an energy system only model, we are missing key elements of determinants of performance. So I would encourage people rather than model-based thinking in how they think about their performance to actually step back from any model and think about speed to endurance continuums and power to endurance continuums. And every week when I'm looking at a training program with any athlete from anything from the, you know, 400 meters, which is 45 seconds all the way to the marathon, I'm looking at where in the training week are we addressing maximal sprint speed or maximal peak power? Where are we addressing maximal aerobic speed and VO2 max? Where are we addressing critical speed, critical power? So I think we have to separate the model from the principles of the model. The principles of the model are working above or below critical power has a physiological cost and a physiological impact. So for sure, critical speed, critical power is something I use. Am I tied to the model of why it estimates in terms of anaerobic capacity or so-called anaerobic capacity? No, because the the noise in that anaerobic energy system space is so noisy. There's so many variables that are integrated into that. It's not just anaerobic energy system, as we talked about. It's neuromuscular system. It's mechanics. It's buffering. So yeah, we're, we're we're talking about W prime here or D prime. When, exactly, when yeah. So so I think ultimately people can get tied to a model, and the reality is like, yeah, that's part of it. That's part of it. But if it, if that's the only thing, then we're missing all these other determinants of, of performance. And and where that really hurts you is when you have people all the way across a continuum of profiles because you're trying to force square pegs into round holes, right? Where, you know, you think of, you know, in professional cycling, like a sprinter like Mark Cavendish, right? Supreme power reserve. Where's that picked up in the in the critical power model? Like maybe it is from W prime, but it's not a clear one-to-one relationship that because you have a large speed reserve, your anaerobic capacity therefore is almost large. That doesn't work like that. There's a big training component to the anaerobic energy system. And the other thing would be is that we know that if we detrain aerobically, what do we do? 
we actually increase the contribution of the anaerobic energy system. And so I would encourage it, encourage people to think about a both and the principles of critical power as well as the principles of speed reserve and not one or the other because ultimately the performance has both of them and training needs to build capacities in both of those. And is the speed reserve important if you're going to race uh, something like if you're a recreational marathoner, you're never mm-hmm. going to go above critical power in your race. Is it still important? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the questions we have to ask is what enables us to hold on and maintain speed when things get difficult in a race, when speed surge towards the end of the race? And there's some good work out of Finland in the 5K and some work in the 10K showing that one of the key pieces of being able to maintain speed is actually the ability to recruit more and more fast twitch muscle to help support doing the work as our slower twitch, more endurance type fibers fatigue. And so if we haven't at some level trained our ability to express force and then to apply that, when it gets difficult, we don't have much anywhere to go, right? The door shuts very quickly. I've tested a lot of marathon runners like this. You do a step test, they're really good in the in the threshold zone, Once you get towards VO2 max, the door shuts really quick because they don't have the seeming of those faster fibers to recruit. So we need to train, even as an endurance dominant person, the ability to recruit more fast twitch muscle and activate that quickly because that's going to help us go with surges. That's going to help us continue to actually maintain speed when things get hard. So yes, we're not talking about hard anaerobic intervals we're talking about you know um your maximal strength low level plyometrics we're talking about those foundational qualities of being able to activate quickly produce force react and recruit our faster twitch muscle and the mechanics to actually change those positions as we speed up Mm, yeah um we talked about a lot of things. Maybe, yeah. do you want to summarize this? And it can also be something new that we haven't mentioned yet, but give your top three tips for the listeners of this podcast that they can benefit from in, in their training and uh, their endurance performance goals uh, that you want them to remember from this episode. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for uh, listening to the wide-ranging conversation. I'll give this summary, summary a go. So the first one would be, we need to understand the speed and endurance balance of athletes within our group because only when we do that can we start to ask better questions about if the current training we're doing is maximizing the gifts the group brings to the table or if we have some people who have, let's say, a very speed-based profile and we're in a very endurance-dominant program, we might be completely mismatching what that person needs. The second point would be, My message is not that we should not train things you are not good at. That is not my message. My message is that we need to train all elements of the speed and endurance continuum year round. But how we address people's weaknesses should be trained through the lens of the profile they are. So, for example, a speed-based athlete, what do we know about them? Someone who's a bit more fast twitch, well, they're going to, with anything continuous, things are going to become more anaerobic very quickly. So through knowing that, if they need to get fitter, then we're probably going to do that through shorter intervals and build volume that way, as opposed to sending them out on 20, 30-minute continuous tempos, which will become way harder than the intention of the session. So we're training the weaknesses through knowledge of who they are. The second point to that would be we're then selecting our training stimulus based on maximizing how each individual is getting to their best performance. So as we talked about in the speed skating example, if we're an endurance-based individual, we really get there by working at a high percentage of our aerobic system for as long as we can. So what does that mean? When going into a championship, we need VO2 max and we need critical speed power as high as we can. We need critical speed at that 95 ish percent of vo2 max we need it as high as we can at that point and the endurance at critical power at that time we want to be at its maximum when we flip to the other side of the equation on the speed side yeah those things are going to have a minimum 
that they need to be at, but the gifts that that athlete is bringing to the table are different. So the sprinting speed needs to, we need to make sure is exactly where we, we want it to be. And then we've done the technical work at, at race pace to make them really efficient at that. So we're looking at every stimulus and training it through who people are, as opposed to here's one model, here's how you prepare for X event. So, well, maybe that will get you the result. But by training through who people are, we can increase our batting average, let's say, of the number of hits we get in maximizing people's training response over time. And for the first zero to two years of someone in being in full-time training, expose them to a bit of everything because they have lots of limiting factors. But it's once we get into your more seasoned athletes who've got a training volume behind them where we really have to think differently about if we want to really maximize them towards the podium, we have to steer into who they are. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And uh, it all makes a lot of sense. Is there anything still that you want to talk about that we didn't touch upon? Or should we move on to the rapid fire questions? I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's a good job. Good, good job, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what is your favorite book or resource related to endurance sports? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, I, I have lots of influences from um, from different ends of the spectrum. So I would say less resources and more people. So a combination of things like podcasts or spending time with people. So an example at the speed power end would be, you know, Angus Ross in New Zealand, uh, Dan Paff or Stu McMillan from Altis, Tom Crick. These guys taught me sprinting and the speed power side of things. Then on the endurance side of things, you know, people like Trent Stellingworth, Paul Larson. Um, yeah. Uh, and then team sport people in there too. Uh, the late great Nick Broad from Chelsea Football Club. Those have been all big big influences on my thinking around around training. And then all the coaches I spend time with. And what's an important habit that you've benefited from athletically, professionally, or personally? Yeah, I would say being consistent. And then, well, I would I would say like when we think about the the training sense, like really honing in on consistency of execution of intention every day and who's somebody to look up to or that has inspired you oh i think i reeled off a good list of people in the in the first one i would also say my influences are not just from within sport but um people in the tech startup business world as well lots of investors people like ray dalio who are very first principles thinkers um that's influenced my practice a lot and uh, finally, where can people follow you? Yeah, so probably a good good place is Twitter, uh, Gareth underscore Sanford. I uh, post there most days around topics like what we've we've discussed. And also you can visit GarethSanford.com where there's a uh, free intro uh, email course for you which walks through that process of how do we individualize an athlete who needs both high levels of speed and endurance. So GarethSanford.com. And uh, yeah, you can start on your own journey with your, your squad today. Hey listeners, this is Michael chiming in here from a couple of weeks after recording this interview. Uh, Gareth has informed me that the uh, website is unfortunately delayed a little bit, so it should be out around the towards the end of July. Follow Gareth on Twitter. That is the best way to keep track of when it's live and when the course will be available. It will be for you. Sorry about the sound quality of this little piece of audio. I am traveling and do not have my microphone with me, so just speaking straight into a computer, and uh, my computer does not have a particularly good built-in microphone, uh, but at least you now you get the information. Back to the episode. And that's awesome. Yeah. And, and being a long time follower of your Twitter, I have to say that it's one of the best Twitter accounts, uh, around in my opinion. And it, uh, I think probably a lot of my guests don't follow it because otherwise I'm sure somebody would have mentioned that in the past for their answer to the question, favorite, uh, book or resource. Um, but, uh, thank you so much, Gareth. Uh, this has been fascinating and I really enjoyed uh enjoyed this discussion although uh, it's actually quite different from my normal interviews because i feel like i'm usually very prepared and have all the questions i did have all the questions but it ended up being more about seeing where the, uh, the conversation took us and uh, you had such the finger on the pulse so well of what what your message is and what you needed to share that that i actually could just sit back and relax and uh and it ended up being a perfect uh overview of of the main topics that we wanted to discuss so so yeah well done for that 
Thank you, Michael. It's been great chatting with you. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com, where you will find links to Gareth's Twitter, ResearchGate, and website. And remember that he has that free email course waiting on the website. We'll have some of his relevant papers on the anaerobic speed reserve and uh, similar topics, and also other papers and uh, related guests and episodes that were mentioned throughout our discussion. And next Monday, we'll have a Q&A and the topic for the Q&A will be racing and testing. It is already recorded by the time you hear this, so uh, there will not be an opportunity to ask questions for that one anymore, but just so that you have something to look forward to. And if you want to improve your triathlon performance and level up to achieve your next goal, there's probably no single better thing that you can do than get some expert help along the way. And at Scientific Triathlon, we provide coaching services that cater to every need from beginners to professionals, where the athlete is in the center, the coaching is grounded in communication and individualization, and the coaches all have a wealth of experience, knowledge, and coaching skills. If coaching is out of your budget or not for you, we also have ready-made training plans for different athlete levels and goal events. And hundreds, if not thousands of athletes have already set big PBs and reached new performance levels with these plans. We also have exchange and or money back guarantees for the training plans, so it's a risk-free investment. You can find all about our coaching training plans, customized training plans and consultation options on scientifictriathlon.com. And to discuss your options, you can email me on michael at scientifictriathlon.com. Finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Fuel and Hydration, that you can find on precisionfuelandhydration.com. If you're looking for electrolytes and fueling products, I would highly recommend trying them out. You can use their free fuel and hydration planner or even a free video consultation with the team to prepare your race strategy. And don't forget to take 15% off your first order with the code TTS23. And thank you to Form that you can find on formzoom.com forward slash TTS. Improve your swim training with real-time metrics like pace, stroke rate and heart rate and advanced post swim analysis. Use the code TTS15 to get 15% off Form Smart Swim Goals. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.